Welcome everyone on this Passion Sunday as we remember the Palm Procession and as we hear the Passion reading in church here the beginning of April as we are here at St. Matthew's Church in Glendale, California. Wherever you are joining us for Bible study either on Zoom or later on YouTube, we're glad to have you with us. We're continuing our study this day of 1 Corinthians, and we are in 1 Corinthians 7. So you can start to turn your Bibles towards 1 Corinthians 7. All these different controversies are happening in this congregation, in this very metropolitan city. The people are kind of wondering how then shall we live if we've been wrapped up in this pagan world with all of the stuff around us and all the temptations around us and now we're trying to follow Jesus and Paul's dealing with some of their questions and it almost seems like a back and forth as if Paul has maybe heard some verbal reports of problems there but they also apparently have written to him and have asked him some questions that he's trying to give pastoral answers to. We used to do a column, Ask the Pastor. In some ways, 1 Corinthians, parts of it are kind of like that, answering the questions to the pastor. And in this section, in the middle of chapter 7, middle to end, actually, we're near the end of chapter 7, uh, Paul's dealing with family life. And that's where we had left off last week. And Paul's trying to answer their questions. It seems that some of the people there in the church at Corinth being wrapped up in all of the sensuality of the city of Corinth uh, and all of the temple prostitution occurring there in Corinth had kind of become almost reacted against it too far to where some are thinking, well, we all have to be celibate or none of us can ever marry. And Paul's wrestling with these questions now of how then do you live? And he's trying to, he's trying to tell them Yes, we need to follow Jesus, but he's also trying to pull them back from going too far in some things and throwing everything out as if you're not going to be living in this world anymore. And he's he's encouraging them to live certain lives, but he's also being very practical in his pastoral advice. Some things he's saying he received this from the Lord when it comes from marriage. Jesus had restated Genesis, basically, as Jesus taught about marriage. And then Paul adds just some pastoral wisdom. And that's kind of what, in a sense, all Christians, and especially pastors, are supposed to do is apply what we have from Scripture to particular cases. And that's that's kind of what Paul is doing at this point, is that pastoral, practical theology and application. Paul told us last week that if he had his druthers, people would stay unmarried. And that seems like, well, maybe he is condemning marriage. But then he's clear that he's not doing that. He simply wants to say that he can kind of foresee what's coming. Not, not prophetically in a sense, but he can see how things are unwinding there in the Roman Empire at this time. And, and the pushback and persecution that is happening towards some of the Christians. And Paul's warning them that persecution is coming and family entanglements will make persecution more difficult for you. And so he kind of says, if you can stay single, you are going to have fewer worries. It's going to be easier on you to go through this. Not that persecution would be easy for anyone, but it's different when you're not having to worry about spouse and children and taking care of them in the midst of intense persecution. And that's where we're going to pick up today. And we're going to pick up at verse 32. I'm going to go back to verse 25 and catch us up with this section. So I'll be reading at 25. Again, 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the unmarried, I have no command of the Lord, but I give you my opinion as one who, by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. I think that in the view of the present distress, it is well for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek marriage. But if you marry, you do not sin. And if a girl marries, she does not sin. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown very short. 
from now on, let those who have wives live as though they have none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as if they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the form of this world is passing away. You might see those last few verses there as he's not commanding these things. He's, he's almost using metaphor. He's using figure of speech that as we see that this world is passing away, that things as we know it are kind of falling apart, we want to unwind ourselves from some things, don't focus so much on some things, and start focusing more on the kingdom and how things are wrapping up as we approach the end times, in a sense. So then he's going to continue with this thought from 30. What version are you using? I was reading the RSV. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Let's pick up then with Carolyn with 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. So I, I don't want you to have all of these other worries in your life. I don't want you to have to be uh, distracted from your care of the kingdom. And so he makes the point that the unmarried person is can, can focus more. And we talked last week about Paul seems to be that at this, well, we pretty clearly Paul is unmarried at this point. Whether he's always been unmarried, that seems a little odd with some things in Acts. Perhaps he's a widower at this point, though he doesn't talk about that. But in the ancient world, when people died so much more often in an era long before antibiotics, you had a lot more widowers and widows at young ages, so that's a high possibility. He's saying that they can focus on this, and I mentioned last week that in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, it's okay for pastors to marry, but if you want to become a bishop, you have to be an unmarried pastor with that idea of there are more distractions and more worries that you don't have time to care for a family. Verse 33, he continues the thought, Clara. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. So somebody, what he's saying is, if you don't have these other distractions, you can focus on the kingdom more. But if you have a family, and he's just said it's not wrong, so remember that is already there, you have other people to please, right? You have to look after other people's interests, your spouse. 34 gives a longer recitation into that. Dalton, are you actually with us or no? Okay, let's go to Julie. Julie, would you read 34? His interests are divided. It is the same with the girl who marries. She faces the same problem. The girl who is not married is anxious to please the Lord and all she is and does. So it's... This is, oh, excuse me, I think... Continue, continue, on, yeah. I'm sorry. But a married woman must consider other things, such as housekeeping and the likes and dislikes of her husband. That's a very, that's a good paraphrase of trying to get down to what the real, what the verse is talking about. He's, he's adding some thoughts in there, but it kind of gets to the, the core of what he's saying, of what Paul is saying, that when you have these other ties, you have other things to consider and to take care of. And those of you uh, in family life, you can, you can picture that situation, that you have to think of the other person's needs and wants. Uh, children even complicate that more, obviously. Uh, what did I just read? Oh, I just read a comment the other day. There's a new roller coaster. In, in, this is obviously something I'd be reading. A new roller coaster at Universal Studios in Florida. And somebody had witnessed this couple, uh, an adult couple who left their 10 and seven year old watching each other alone for an hour so they could go off and ride the roller coaster. Oh. I, <laughs> just that gasp. That's pretty much how people were reacting online to that. Yes, leaving these two kids alone. But that show, the ideal would be somebody would not do that. You have other people to consider in your life. And with children, you kind of have to put their needs first and a spouse in a sense too, but especially with children, those familial ties are time consuming, not in a bad way. They're just a focus. And Paul's saying, this, this are other focus 
there, there are other things you have to be then concerned about. So here he kind of clarifies the comment, and you've all bounced around on the screen a little bit. Uh, Tracy, would you read 35, please? Now, I say this for your own welfare and profit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is seemingly and in good order and to secure your undistracted and undivided devotion to the Lord. Not to restrict you, or what other translations do you have there? Restraint. Restraint. Not restraint. Okay. It's actually, it can be not cast a snare. And the, the word actually means if you've seen, oh, you see it in cartoons sometimes, or uh, I suppose even not just cartoons, but yeah, can you picture like a, a lasso on the ground? You ever see where they tie a tree branch to catch an animal and it snaps and it gets them around the feet and then it hoists them up in the air? That's the word here. That he's using is that type of snare. I'm not saying this to ensnare you, like I'm trying to trap you into or force you to live this way. That's not my point, he's saying. I'm simply trying to encourage you to have an undivided attention for the Lord, to attend upon the Lord without distraction. So it's there's nothing wrong. This is perfectly normal. Some people are given this gift, some people are given another gift. But when we move into this time of anxiety and persecution, it's probably easier on you not to do this. But I'm not trying to trap you with my words. I'm not trying to force you into anything. Gene, would you read 36, please? If anyone thinks that he is not good behaving properly toward his fiance, if his passions are strong, and so it has to be, let him marry as he wishes. It is no sin, let them marry. I mean, that almost sounds ridiculous to us, right? Oh, go ahead, marry your fiance, that's not sinning. Well, of course that sounds, but remember, he's apparently answering a question from people who have gone too far the other way, thinking, oh, well, this marriage, we're talking arranged marriage back then, this marriage should be arranged, but now I'm supposed to be following Jesus, maybe I'm not supposed to get married. He say, no, that's not the point here at all. Go ahead, get married. Verse 37, Judy H. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart, to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. And can you go ahead and read 38 also, Judy? Oh, sorry. So that he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do better. No, I, I added 38 there, so okay. just because the thought goes together. So he's basically saying, if you're going to get married, that's fine. If you're not going to get married, that's fine, and you'll probably have less trouble. But he's not condemning either one. And again, this seems so basic to us that when people read 1 Corinthians, they'll sometimes go down a rabbit hole of, of Paul being anti-marriage or Paul being anti-woman or different things, read the context that he's dealing with. We're going to enter a period where some of you are going to have some pretty horrible times. And if you're also having to worry about how others are going to be falling prey to this persecution, I'm simply trying to save you some gray hair, we might say today, right? Maybe not in this room, but that's kind of his point is, I'm trying to save you some worries that in the present distress, in view of the present distress. Then Pastor Key? Yep. Isn't it, I think it's really interesting that these people are thinking so much about all this stuff and going into such detail in their thoughts that they would come up with all of these minuscule issues that he is now addressing. I just think that it kind of shows that at least they were really taking it seriously and really thinking about it. Very true. Yeah, they are obviously, I mean, there are problems there in Corinth and they've got problems. And we heard about the one guy who's kind of a real problem, but it seems like a lot of people there in the church in Corinth are really trying to struggle and, and decide how, how should we live? That really is important to them. And they're really trying to, wouldn't it be, I mean, we certainly don't, but wouldn't it be fascinating if we, uh, had access still to this day of the letter that was sent to Paul. 
right? That what what he's responding to. Of course, we don't. Uh, last night was ABC's annual telecast of the Ten Commandments. Anybody watch? Part of it. Part of it. <laughs> I usually, whenever it's on, I pop in the DVD because I don't want to sit through all the commercials and stay up till midnight when I have to be up at 6 a.m. the next day. But I did watch last night, uh, starting earlier. And I don't know if on the telecast, did anybody watch the telecast from the beginning? No. No. Okay. Didn't watch it. So the way it was shown in the theaters and the way it is on the DVD, which I don't know if ABC did, but on the DVD and in the theater, it begins with Cecil B. DeMille coming out be from behind old theater curtains and kind of giving an introduction to the film. And we've used it once here for Wednesday classes. And so some of you may remember Cecil B. DeMille comes out, gives his introduction, and he says, I know this is a little odd for the director to begin the film by coming out and talking to you. Uh, but he's just kind of like talking about what the film is. And in that introduction, he talks about the inspiration for the film. And he says, some of these things we get from the Bible, and some of these things we get from historians. He mentions Philo and Josephus in particular. And then he says, and that's why I bring this up, he says, the reason is they lived Philo at the time of Jesus and Josephus just shortly after Jesus, and they had access to documents that we don't have today. And that's probably true, that as they wrote their histories, there were still copies of documents which have been lost to history that we don't have. And so that's one why when DeMille puts the film together, he looks at scripture as his primary source. And then in the credits, the very end of the credits is based on the writings of uh, Philo, Josephus, Eusebius, one other, and then a new frame and the holy scriptures in, in very fancy font. So that's the ultimate authority that that, uh, that DeMille is using, but he also took ideas from these others because they had this source material. Wouldn't it be cool if we still had that source material in all those cases, but especially here? Some, some scholars posit that many of those things, maybe not this letter, but many of those ancient writings were at the Library of Alexandria, which is lost to history, and there's different theories on that. Probably the most prevailing is that Julius Caesar ends up setting fire when he's trying to exercise his control over Egypt, and all of that is lost. Uh, there is, if, you, uh, if you've been to Epcot in Disney World, the spaceship Earth, the big round ball that you always see, the golf ball. The ride that's in there is narrated by Jane Duty, Judy Dench, and she talks about that in the ride. And then she mentions that some of those lost pieces were preserved by certain Jewish and Arab scholars. And so some things we do have through them and through traditions, but most of it was lost. That was a long way around to, wouldn't it be cool to have all those documents from the past and we could see what really Paul is addressing. But yeah, obviously the people are very serious. Okay, Mr. Acolyte, why don't you read verse 39, please? Now here he's going to give some marriage advice. Marriage in the first century is not marriage in the 21st century. It isn't the same as far as definitions or understandings or economics or, or many different things. He's remember as you read these things that he's addressing their questions in their context. It gives us some broad guidance as we understand these things, but he's dealing with particular situations. He continues that thought, 40. Karen, you want to read 40, please? In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I, too, have the Spirit of God. He's saying, he's saying I have the Spirit of God, meaning 
this this is a verse that seems to imply that he's probably a widower. And while he's not saying he's happy about that, he's saying that it's probably best not to try to get into another relationship because of all that else is going on. And I suppose different people would have different perspectives. Again, he's dealing in a specific time with specific people and specific questions. But he's talking about, uh, well, today there'd probably be some people who end up in a different relationship situation in the latter part of their life who, who wouldn't want to go back into another one because they're happier as they are. And that seems to be where he is. Uh, but again, it's against the background of what's coming and the liabilities that he might see going on. That's kind of the end of chapter seven. Questions on that? I asked for questions. In my, my Bible, it says in verse 36, instead of fiance, and then it says virgin daughter. Mm -hmm. And that, that's closer to, let me pull the Greek out. I assume it's Parthenu, but let me check it. Yeah. So it's the same word uh, that is used uh, by Matthew, Luke, for to describe Mary, Parthenon. If you think of the Parthenon in uh, in Athens, same root word here. The Parthenon is this temple to Athena. Uh, it's it's you. I mean, it's, it's debatable how to translate it at times. Uh, it can be used in the sense of a virgin, but it's literally more like young woman. But understand that in the first century they wouldn't have made a distinction between those two things the way that we might today. Okay. Does that make sense? Without me having to go into graphic detail to explain that, that their, their customs and standards were a little different back then, that the one would be assumed to be the other in the first century. It wasn't always true, of course, any more than it would be today. Well, probably more so than today, but it wouldn't always be true, but it would be assumed to be true. and especially in Jewish culture, you'd have real ramifications when it wasn't, and not just Jewish culture. There were others that were. Uh, for in the rabbinic tradition, the way it was often handled was you would assume a young man couldn't control himself. And so there were options, but young women didn't have options. For a young man, those op options were prostitution, or some rabbis would go so far as to say any non-Jewish girl was kind of fair game, uh, but you weren't going to marry one in the end. Uh, but but women were assumed to have no option until their wedding. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So don't don't read too much into the word virgin there, other than to assume that it's a. Uh, it's probably better translated young woman. Did I see a hand? No? Well, chapter, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction then. Chapter 80 is going to continue this argument with, with an argument which almost seems even more obscure because it's going to be talking, he's going to be talking about food sacrifice to idols. That's not, I mean, if marriage was different back then, and we don't have to deal with all the issues that he was talking about, we certainly in our day and age don't really deal with the issue of going to the marketplace and wondering whether or not what Ralph's is selling was first sacrificed to some false god, right? Not something that you and I have to deal with, but this is Paul doing practical application of how then do we live in that culture, and we can take broad points out of it about how to live. But the basic idea there is that in first century Greco-Roman society, most of the meat that was available to buy in markets was meat that had been sacrificed to pagan idols. The, the pagan priests took some and they sold the rest off to marketers who then sold it. And that's how you normally got your meat. So then as you're a Christian living in this world and you're thinking, well, I'm not supposed to have any good anything to do with those false gods. What about this chain of custody about where this meat came from? And so while there were 
apparently some in the Corinthian church with marriage who thought, well, maybe we have to be celibate. Even if I'm married, maybe our marital life is over and we're just going to sit. Maybe that's what we've got to do. And Paul's, no, 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 calm down. One of the overreactions that we seem to find that happens in Corinth is if this meat is questionable, what might be an overreaction to that? eating meat <laughs> some some of them appeared to be becoming vegetarians now yeah. there might be good health reasons and and in this era there'd be people debating that but there weren't a lot of people who were philosophically vegetarian probably in the first century the way that there might be today uh or or based on health understandings health understand. like we would today but apparently some of them there in corinth were becoming vegetarians more out of a troubled conscience, thinking they shouldn't be involved in the meat industry because of what was going on. And so he's going to address that as we move into aid of how then do we live with this situation? We'll be looking for the broad applications also. All right. Next week, of course, is Easter. We're not going to meet for the next couple of weeks. We'll see you soon. In a couple of weeks, watch your Saturday emails. You'll be able to see if there's the link for Bible class or prayer time or whatever, or you'll see that there's no link and it says we'll gather again in a couple of weeks, uh, but we'll be together again soon. Let's close with prayer. Jesus' suffering and death unites us in the hope of resurrection. In resurrection hope, we now pray. We pray for the church, that the sacrifice of Jesus may be celebrated everywhere. God, receive our prayer. God, receive our prayer. We pray for the sick, that we may be open to the blessings that Christ has won for us and share them with all. In faith, we pray, God, receive our prayer. God, receive our prayer. We pray for the poor, the oppressed, the afflicted, that the power of the cross will give them hope as they see it active in our compassion and concern. God, receive our prayer. God, receive our prayer. We pray for our faith community wherever we might be, that we will journey with our Savior during this Holy Week from the upper room to Calvary and to the empty tomb. God, receive our prayer. God, receive, God, our, receive prayer. our prayer. God, ever close to us, may these prayers be added to the great prayer of your Son in the upper room, who died for us and is our Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, a couple minutes to say goodbye, and then we'll see you all, if not before, in a couple weeks. Uh, Janet, just yeah. to let you know, I did talk to Dolores Panahan, and she'll okay. get to me after their service today. Okay, super. Nobody's saying goodbye. Okay. Bye. 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 Happy Easter. 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 Happy Easter.